Wonderful. If we can have everyone who's in the back a little bit come forward. We, we need to be a congregation here. So if, if anyone in the back wants to come forward. And now if everyone can stand up, we're gonna start the service with a little bit of a confession. So stand up, get out of your seats. Apostles, stand up. So just repeat after me. I confess. In my loneliness, it's not a Britney Spears song, that I have let technology detach me from others. In my vanity, I have taken selfies and self-promoted on social media. I ask you, fellow users, to help deliver me from false intimacy and treat others as people. Amen. You may now be seated. We're going to start with a reading from our first apostle. Function quick sort A. Hey. If length A is less than or equal to one, return A. Select and remove a pivot element, pivot from array. Create empty list less and greater. For each X in A, if x is less than or greater than append x to less, else append x to greater. Return concatenate quicksort less, list pivot quicksort greater. Thank you. And now our next apostle will lead us in a short hymn. Please stand and join in on the choruses. Tech is coming like the glory of the morning on the wave. Tech is wisdom to the mighty. Tech is honor to the brave. So the world shall be tech's footstool and the entrepreneurs its slave. Our tech is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. have seen the glory of the singularity. Tech is trampling out the remnants of monopolies of your Tech has used the fateful market as its terrible switch sword. Tech's truth is marching on. Everybody. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory. Thank you. Wonderful.
I'm now going to share a short sermon called The Power of Buttermilk. Many of you are perhaps here today because of your love of buttermilk. The power of buttermilk is the power of tradition. Buttermilk is good, is good as it is. You don't need to innovate it. It's a metaphor for recognizing that some things are good and don't need innovating, and that some traditions are worth keeping. I want to talk about the power of buttermilk at a time when the tech scene offers vacuous promises for disruption, pivots, and growth hacks. At a time when corporate brands are tr trying to fulfill our spiritual needs by offering us doses of belonging as consumers and as employees. At a time when our seeker infrastructure and sacred spaces have been dismantled in favor of accelerators, hackathons, and conferences. We are living within the tyranny of the urgent, and urgency, I believe, is a waste of time. You see, I moved from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to Silicon Valley. I traded in my agrarian upbringing and Amish life for a glimpse into the belly of the beast, the tech scene. I spoke to people about their first memories of technology, the first time in a chat room, using a cell phone, or navigating clunky old search engines. And when people talk about their first memory of technology, it's like they're talking about magic. People spoke about feeling joy, awe, delight, feeling a sense of wonder, but a lot of that wonder has gone away. Today, we are overwhelmed with push notifications, transactional online relationships, and addictive user design. Tech is turning us into zombies. One witness told me, when I use digital tech for extended periods of time, I don't like what it does to me. My mind becomes unfocused and scattered. The more I spoke to people, the more I realized that we all have an inner Amish, a shyness towards technology, a grumbling or critique. Digital technology makes us commit sins on autopilot. These sins are built into the design. On Facebook, my agency is reduced to a like. My narcissism and vanity are encouraged. I commodify myself and engage with others as commodities or brands. Being brought up in the Amish community and raised with a belief in the power of opting out and taking a stand against the destructive forces of modern life, I know this desire to hide out and retreat. But at the same time, there's part of me that wants to desperately be of service, to shape the machines that are coming to control us. And that's why I've invited these apostles here today. These are people who are working on reshaping our relationship with digital technology. These apostles are making sure that our digital technologies have a soul. They are engineers with a conscience. They understand the power of buttermilk and are using their hearts and heads to build tools that connect us with the best parts of our humanity. Please welcome them. Thank you guys for joining. As you can see, this is the universe. And we're maybe a tiny microscopic part of this universe. And so when you look at the tech scene, what is the latest at matter? You know, how do you think of technology within this big question of why we're here? Why are we building these machines? And Apostle Jay, I want to start with you. I, I think it's, it's very interesting to, to explore this search and actually observe at the moment within the tech scene even, there is this question of why we're actually building these machines. I was at a conference on the Internet of Things last week, and most of the people in the room were urging each other to search for meaningful ways to use this technology, to find a means whereby it could actually be useful in our reality, 
They were wandering around with a funny-shaped hammer looking for a nail of the right shape. They were trying to apply a solution that was shiny and sexy and attractive to real-world problems that were an ill fit for what they were searching to do. And the reason they were doing this, partly that it's sexy and it's hyped and it's interesting and excites them, but that's not enough. You, if you want to do it as a toy, admit that it's a toy. Admit that you're playing, but don't try and make it relevant and tangible to the world when it's not. The real driver is that uh, venture capitalists and um, investors are interested in this because these are high risk situations. So money is driving us into this bubble of hype. The idea has expanded beyond its true meaning and we have to look at the world around us and look at the real problems and think, what, what is the problem we're really trying to solve? And how do we be present? And how do we be empathetic? And how do we use our human skills to solve these problems rather than fleeing our, our, ourselves in the search of technology as a savior for us? Wonderful. Yeah. Amen. Amen, sister. <laughs> and Apostle Alex, does that, do you relate to that? I mean, how, do you feel like there's, you mentioned post-technology earlier when we were speaking. But what do you feel like about this technology that is enabling us to actually get in touch with what it means to be human? Is that something you're working on? I completely agree with Jay what he said, that it's like uh, you look for, for a nail for this huge uh, hammer that you've got like, that economically driven there's this, this innovation and just because it's possible we, we try to use it. But I think like post tech for me means like stepping one, one step back looking for the needs, like really what do we need, and then looking for solutions for this one, and not the other way around. And also like with the venture capital and with the economic system driving everything, when you look at, at Facebook, at other big companies, they spend millions just of engaging the users, just to make more people online, just to interact that you are there. And that's like where we at off time, we, we try to, to enable, to really let you customize your connectivity, also let you have back the power again to really like unplug, unplug just enough and not be driven by this, oh, there's another notification, there's another need for looking, hey, is there a status update, whatever, and just like stepping back again, giving you the freedom and the space to breathe again and just like come up again with, with other ways and be more here and just, yeah, just like uh, let you not drive by, by the other forces. And you're building something called off time. How, how exactly does that work? Do you feel like, you know, one of the sort of emerging trends that we're seeing is this sort of nostalgia tech wave of people building technologies to actually enable us, you know, an app for self-control, for example, to en enable us to disengage with tech. Do you feel like the, what you're building is part of a passing trend or is it a part of the permanent solution, this kind of infrastructure? My optimism, my hope is that, it's, that we find our own balance and that like the children now growing up with tech, they just find their own balance, how they engage. I think our generation, we just like have been thrown into this, like there was 50,000 years of evolution where there wasn't, like information was really rarely accessible and now the last years it just radically changed and we are just not really equipped with this change of, of access, accessibility. And so yes, I, I hope that it's changing, but right now I think we, we, need this, uh, we need this support and I think it's, some people say, oh, you just need the discipline to, to disengage. And, but discipline also needs, you, you have to have energy and you, you, you spend energy of, of, of uh, yeah, your, your own energy of disacting or to disengaging with things which you can spend with other things which are much more useful with engaging with other people and not with keeping up this energy and also like keeping up with this energy with Facebook, Google and whatever, all the other companies who are driven to, to optimize the algorithm that they really look for your weaknesses to bring you back online. That's like a fight you can only lose. And so I think we need the technology. We need a different sort of technology which also like looks after technology, like technology which enables us as well not to use technology because that's, tech is there to help us, so I think it should also be there to, to enable us not to use technology. It's interesting because a lot of these kinds of 
programs, it's almost like we're outsourcing our morality to technology. So we need, rather than just practicing self-control, which used to be in these sort of religious systems, used to help us with that kind of regulation, now we're turning to technology to actually enable certain human virtues. Um, and Erica, Apostle Erica, I wanted to turn to you as well, uh, because on this theme of nostalgia tech, I think the literary startup that you're a part of is very interesting because it's bringing back Dickens' idea of, um, you know, this serialized content. So rather than just giving someone a book, you release it a little bit of a time, at a time, and it has this very charming old world connotation. Um, can you tell me a bit about the spirit of what you're working on with Pigeonhole? Yeah. So it's a publishing company called The Pigeonhole, which is launching later this year. And like uh, the Amish futurist was saying, um, we're we want to publish books in serial format, like they were a couple of hundred years ago, in the newspapers, which were the cool technology of their day, um, and which everybody could read at the same time, discuss it, and, and follow a story all together. And so we wanted to bring back that kind of communal feeling of reading, you know, sharing a story, a bit like how, you know, people will watch live TV and discuss it, or, you know, when, when receiving something artistic and cultural becomes something that happens through time that you do in the world with other people as opposed to just being a product that you download and then squirrel away by yourself. Trying to get in engagement, but not in that... I'm not a techie, I've got to say. I'm not a, I'm not a real techie. Um, I, uh, I find this all very fascinating, this sort of self-referential world that I find myself in a little bit. But when I say engagement, I mean actual engagement, re interaction. Um, the idea that you can have an artistic experience and actually engage with it re in a real way. We want to try and get that back because in the industry that I came from, which is the traditional publishing industry, people aren't, people aren't engaging with that anymore. People aren't reading. They're not really seeing that, that format, the book format, as relevant anymore. And, it's, and I guess what we thought was that a story, a narrative that can make you think deeply about the world or about yourself, isn't actually tied into the format that it's delivered in. It just happens to be that for the last hundred years it's come in the form of an object, a book. But there are other ways. And so it was, it was that quest really to sort of rethink how you tell stories, how we share stories. And what I love about what you guys are building is you're actually enabling authors and readers to be in closer conversation too. So this whole barrier between author and reader is dissolving a little bit. Um, which is nice because I always hated this idea of like this Proust-like writer who just like squirreled away in an attic. Um, and this way you actually get to see what's going on in the mind of the author as they're crafting something. Yeah, n um, we've had really interesting conversations with authors because some authors really want to be Proust and sit in an attic and produce their great work of art and then sort of let it do the talking for them. Other, other writers really want to talk to readers directly, and at the moment, the main ways you can do that is by speaking at an event like this to maybe 100 people, or um, kind of arguing with them through Amazon review comments, which is a bit depressing. So, um, Getting their friends to write fake reviews. Exactly, that does happen quite a lot. So trying to find a kind of uh, a bullshit free way of actually talking together online is, um, is what we're trying to achieve with that as well, that getting, getting it more direct. Beautiful. And Apostle Jay, I want to return to some of your earlier reflections um, and really ask you around what you feel like the new sort of sin landscape looks like within technology. Like what, you know, you encounter these douchebags that you meet various places and you have a sort of mounting critique, I guess, but for everyday sort of users of technology, what, do you, what sort of sins do you feel like technology makes us commit? I, I think, I, I wouldn't use the term douchebag, <laughs> I'm always all upset but, uh, a lot of people, um, but also I think like we, we're all victims of this in, in some way, shape or form. Um, but I, I think the greatest sin is the one you've already touched upon, which is kind of the, the, the disconnect. Like the, on one hand we're trying to connect with one another, but and use the technology as a tool to connect with one another. But on the other hand, we're disconnecting from our surroundings. We're not being present in the world. We're not observing who's around us and who we could be in immediately, immediate contact with. Instead, we're always searching for something more. 
And it's almost like being a kind of hyper networker at, a, at an event, you know, the kind of person that you talk to. And they're always scouting a room for somebody else to talk to. They're always scouting for somebody more interesting to, to come along or somebody that's relevant for their, for their network or their business or whatever. And it's kind of using people in a very cynical manner rather than just being present with them and just actually taking the time to look at who's around you, look at what's in the world and I exist and, and connect with it in a, in a meaningful way. And, and I think this is really important and we really need to get back in touch with this because if we're not mindful of the world around us, then we'll, we'll forget why it's important and why we're all important and we, we should value the relationships that we have and also those that we don't and pay attention to people. And why do you guys feel like we forget this bigger why? why? Why is there a focus on these tools rather than some of the bigger challenges going on in the world or these things that we, um, we could really pay more attention to? I feel like the kind of category mistake that we make between tools and the message behind them or what the, the use of the tool, and that, that is kind of what this boils down to, isn't it? We think that interaction uh, processes on social media, for example, are communication when they're actually not, that they're one step away from that, or at least one. But that, I feel like it's, it's, it's to do with how, how able we are to accept simulation in our life. And um, when, you know, like Alex was saying, the algorithms that have been developed to kind of get certain reactions out of us, we, if, we don't, if we don't stop and think about what we're actually Okay, is this a tool, or is this, actually, is this actually what I'm communicating, or is this just how I'm communicating it? Unless you stop and think about that, it's very, very easy to just go down that path and then for your, uh, for your framework just to reduce to those processes. And it's not just communication technology that that's happened in. We, we do that in our, across our whole lives. We end up reducing just a series of processes and judging our successes or failures based on those alone instead of what they mean. Um, but meaning takes deep thinking and, you know, time. Um, and maybe it's, yeah, it's just getting that energy and discipline going. Maybe we're all just a bit lazy, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd pick up on that laziness thing. I think it's because actually technology can be, to a degree, an easier way, or we feel it's easy. And, and it's easy also because it is, to a degree, can be so shallow. It's not nuanced. You, you can't get emotion across in text. I mean, we have emoticons, but they're, they're limited. And yet, human-to-human -human relationships is nuanced. It's like how we're feeling, uh, our emotional state of mind when we're engaging with one another, our, our own uh, language preferences or our religious backgrounds or our, our upbringing or our psychology. And each time we relate to one another, on a human-to-human -human scale, we have to renegotiate that, that API, well, like that, that means of interacting with one another. And technology can kind of streamline that a bit, that it does feel nice and easy, and that we can easily drop it or just walk away from a conversation without anybody even noticing it. But that's, that, that's also what's dangerous about it, is it doesn't allow for that depth and challenge and growth. Like we had this reconnect room outside and we collected the last days like different statements about being online and offline and what connects to there is also like somebody wrote uh, it's not about being online and offline which is clear but it's more like leaving your comfort zone online and offline and just like getting out of this it's sometimes di sometime difficult and you've got just to get over yourself and just like get out there, reach out there, become a bit more conscious be a bit more mindful about those different things and also build in the space of reflection and also look for the emotions which come up when you use technology, what's just before if you are afraid, if there's fear, if there's joy or whatever and just look what emotion is there before you really interact with technology and I think this little reflection already opened up so many possibilities and not just like being in this constant drive of just like, yeah, moving on and just interacting and interacting for the sake of interacting. And there's just something I was thinking about, which is um, we're really stimulation junkies, I think. 
Um, and it's a little bit like we were talking about in our confession that we made all together about being lonely. And there's something about craving very high levels of affirmation or shock or whatever the emotion is, it has to be really huge and instant. And, and as Jay was saying, normal human interaction is not like that. You know, even with someone who you have a very deep relationship with, it's not going to be super highs and lows all the time. It's probably going to be somewhere in the middle and a bit difficult to define. And, um, and you don't get that kind of hit, but you do. These, there are, you know, so many of the programs we use regularly are designed to create that. But the problem is that you, you experience the super high, for example, but you experience it on a, you know, like a news feed. So you oh, big high, okay, move to the next thing. And like it's so transient, but so super stimulating that it becomes addictive. It's not an excuse, it's just this is, you know, how they're built. But I mean, there the, the analogy between like uh, social media as a new junk food comes in because like it's just like bits of pieces, information, social information. We are just like humans, we are connected to this. We are just like our dopamine level just works on this. And it's just a little thing, and as junk food, it's nice and it's sweet, but it, given, it doesn't give a full nutrition. And you don't feel it immediately, and it's nice, and the sugar pushes you up, but on the long term, you really have to see where you go and what's your nutrition. And with food, you really see it, and or you, you feel it that you don't have the power. Like, what's happening in your mind, you don't, you don't see the effects as fast as you see it with other nutrition. You might feel a little bit dizzy and everything, but... It's like, yeah, you get the next shock, the next bit of information. I feel like this focus on emotion is, is really interesting just, you know, because in theory, tech is this vehicle that enables us to have heightened emotional experience with others that we wouldn't otherwise be able to have. So it's this human to human thing. But then there's also this emotion that you bring to tech as a tool, as the medium. Um, and being mindful of that state of emotion, you know, Alex, as you're saying, before you do, before you lock on to Facebook or before you tweet and understanding what's going on there seems very important. Um, but other kinds of emotions also surface. So there's online, there's this museum of endangered sounds where you can listen to technology sounds that have gone extinct. And one is like a fax machine. And it's, it's funny because it's, you listen to them and there's some sort of pang of nostalgia and it really takes you back to these, to these moments. Um, and so tech has become so embedded in human memory. Um, and our emotional processing, and even sometimes like it brings up superstition. I know if I'm on a computer um, and I'm in my Amish character and I, a, you, a browser freezes or something, I'm like, oh, I wasn't meant to go to that browser. Or, you know, like it activates these weird um, kinds of emotional peaks. Do you guys have um, any particular emotion emotional sort of attachments to technology? Are there any tools where you, or even noises that tech makes? Like, what is, what is your relationship with this object? You know, uh, there was a funny salon that we did when I first came to Berlin that was about sex robots. And so we, we began to understand, you know, what if you had these, like, personified robots? How would that change the emotions involved in, in having sex? <laughs> um. I, <laughs> I don't have any superstitions per se, but I'm really nostalgic about um, Super Nintendo. And all the sounds from Super Nintendo, I'm a child of the 80s, so that, you know, even there was a little crocodile on one of the games that made a certain sound that I just love. And even now, if I hear a natural sound that sounds like that bloody crocodile, like a sound, it just makes me feel... I don't know, something, it, it's a real emotion, even though it's just attached to a computer game. I guess my relationship with technology is kind of defined by loading and crashing. And when, when, when I was a kid, we had a Sinclair Spectrum and we used to not be able to breathe um, when it was loading. It would just make this kind of <laughs> like loading sound and then it would almost inevitably crash. So we have to kind of work out ways of like keeping as still as we possibly could to, uh, to avoid that crashing. But it seems like every new technical leap, whether it's like moving into broadband and internet and TV streaming and everything else, my life seems to be, technologically speaking, punctuated by these kind of meditative windows of loading bars followed by a fail icon. And <laughs> that kind of defines my relationship with technology to a degree. 
This opens up an, another question in my mind where, where we could go in the discussion as well. It's like the relationship, are we, like, is technology serving us or are we serving technology? What you say, it sounds like you're a caregiver for it. And when I look after my emotion as well, it's like uh, my parents had like one of the first mobile devices you could carry al along at home. So we didn't have this phone with the line, but you could already carry it around. And I still... I still remember the beep when the battery was nearly flat and it's like the beep like bring me back to the station and then you had to carry it back but it was always like this beep, beep, nearly dying so you really pick it up and you bring it there. I guess that's why Tamagotchis were so successful. Yeah. <laughs> the, the pet like digital, yeah those were fun. Um, so what I'd love to do now is really open to the audience for for additional questions, for any of your reflections, and and really just join in the conversation here. Um, talk about any technology sins that you feel like are really present to you in this moment, and any questions for our apostles or for myself ab around the role of technology and and human relationships. Any questions out there? No, there's one. Do we have Just a microphone? Yeah, 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 no okay. problem. <laughs> Maybe it's not really a question, just more like something what amuses me recently that people are creating apps that actually their main goal is to disconnect us from the other apps, which I found really, really funny, because why should I use an app for that? This is, like, I think it really fits the topic. I had lots of thoughts about those things recently, so, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks. Let's, let's take, like, two other comments, and then we'll open it up. <clears throat> okay. Uh, hi. Um, very interesting discussion. Um, I'm working as a kind of software developer in the energy market. So I'm trying to grab the thought that this is completely like useless or senseless. I, I thought it was important, yeah. Um, what, I, what I do is basically grab ideas from people, ideas about either automation or new potential, new things that they want to do, like find a strategy for the network that they're operating so it's cheaper or better or anyway. Um, I'm, I'm trying to guess these ideas and help the people. Um, I do not feel like a sinner by doing this. It's, it's a way to earn money. And what do you think about it? Wonderful. So a question about the existential position of making technology. Great. Any other questions? How do you? Yeah. yeah. Um, I believe in, uh, that, that a lot of us are in this age of technical indulgence where we build because we can, not necessarily because we have necessity, um, or we decide that there's necessity because we have the software infrastructure to do it. But sometimes we get caught up in that, in the convenience of things, but we don't think about the people or the processes that are affected. But at the same time, if we don't build in the pursuit of being better, we're gonna stagnate and we don't really wanna embrace Ludditism, which is hating technology for the sake of hating technology. Um, do, you, do you think that we should stagnate and stop progressing in all ways? Great, so let's go for, with those for now and then we'll open up again. Um, so for you guys, I think that this last question is about stagnation and what's the right role for sort of technological development versus um, this sort of Amish or Luddite or Mennonite kind of world. Uh, the second question is really almost, you know, this existential sort of point of what if you figure out that what you're building isn't really meaningful in the wider scheme of the universe, what do you do? <laughs> um, Jay, I feel like you would, you would have some good answers there. Um, and then I think the first point is really interesting, which is now all these tech companies are really profiting around building apps to get us to not use other apps. And that seems like a bit of an oxymoron in a way. Do you want to take the apps on first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I don't know if there are like now many apps profiting of not using other apps. I think the main system is still like of developing apps. Uh, which you use and which where you consume and what you do stuff and and where you help and I think it's a very tiny bit uh, minority of apps which enable you of using not other apps and the question why why you why you have to use it why you can't just switch off I think everybody knows it like not using the phone in the morning or in the evening and then like in the morning the first thing what you do is you look at your device or in, in the evening and then you've got to ask yourself, okay, why do you need apps not using apps? Then reflect on, hey, why, why did you change your plan? And I think our will is very, uh, very strong, but our, this flesh is, is schwach. And I, I don't know how to say it in English. And there's, there's this whole industry behind it, just like looking for your weaknesses. And yeah, why do you spend your energy on just fighting with those ones and just like use technology to let fight for it and just help them that yeah use technology that really creates the space for yourself i think that's that's the main thing what you should use don't use this app or this web app but just reflect which really which tools give you enable you and really help you and which tools make you more like a slave of it in this sense I might try and adjust, uh, address the meaning and the stagnation thing at the same time. It might be incoherent, but I'll, I'll, I'll try. Um, on the stagnation issue, I think it's also important to recognize that as technology progresses, it actually becomes more and more narrow. It's not actually becoming more and more open. Is, is, is actually stagnating as a form of progress almost. So the reason that trains and buses and cars are the dimensions that they are is they're based on the measurements of two horses' asses. And it's the same with technology. As it progresses, we build boxes within boxes within boxes. Our idea of a computer is shaped originally by a typewriter combined with a television. All our devices are progressing along this kind of intellectual availability of our experience of technology. So I would argue to a degree we're already stagnating. Um, I think it's important that we look at meaning first and foremost. Why are we doing what we're doing and what kind of world do we want to live in? Because technology does shape our lives and it does create the world in which we live. Um, and I use a very broad term when I talk about technology, language as a technology. Um, words and uh, writing on pieces of paper is a technology I use quite a lot of on a lot of occasions to connect people. The systems that we exist in and the businesses, they are likewise a technology and they shape our relationships with one another and they shape the lives that we have. I would urge you to look at the life that you want to have, how you want to relate to the world, how you want to relate to yourself and how you want to relate to the other people around you. Focus on that and how you can actually have a meaningful existence that fulfills you day in, day out, more than sustains. Don't work because you have to. Don't work to keep going. And don't progress just for the sake of progress. Explore what really means something to you and then you can begin to explore what technology can do to assist you to get there. Whether that technology is a spade in your garden or a smile that you use with a stranger or a digital device if you so choose it. Look first at the meaning and then you can look at what you can do to solve that problem or improve your life and find that meaning. Super inspiring. Um, on the, the stagnation progress question, a lot, just like Joe was saying, a lot of progress that you see is actually incremental changes, not, not real innovation. They're just small, small changes, and that's kind of the way that business is set up. People are rewarded for making tiny, tiny improvements. And it's, you're more rewarded if you make a series of tiny improvements than if you in innovate something in one big go. And, and that's, I wouldn't call that progress. So just doing that because you can you know, I kind of feel like, what's the point? But the real exciting innovations that have happened throughout history, if you take in technology as being a broad 
thing like Jay is talking about. They've all come out of stuff people needed or were really, really excited about. Sometimes you can invent something by accident because you're really interested. So it doesn't just have to be, you know, because you're having a crisis and you need a solution. Sometimes it can be for fun too, and that's cool. But um, for the sake of making a tiny improvement is never a good reason to innovate, I don't think. Fantastic. And one of the conversations on this question of stagnation and should we all become Amish, because that doesn't seem like a good reality either, is I was having a conversation with Zach Klein, who founded uh, Vimeo and is now running something called DIY.org. And his perspective was interesting because he really got sucked into the startup scene and then ended up building this kind of hermitage in upstate New York where he got to go into the pine forests and um, get away from internet. And so they built this whole structure of cabins and things where people would come and just detox. And now in San Francisco, you have regular digital detox trips for people. Uh, you have something called Camp Grounded, which is happening this summer, which is summer camp for adults where you're not allowed to network and you're not allowed to use any kind of technology and you just have to like go use a bow and arrow and go canoeing and like maybe make out with someone as you did when you were 13. And I think the, this, this definitely points to something symbolically where we're, we are looking for these other experiences to retreat and to get away from technology. Um, I think it's important for us all to have these kinds of Amish instincts and I've spent the last couple months, I rented a, a little rural hermit hideout in Pennsylvania. And I think what I, what I basically try and practice is to bring the spirit of that hermit life into New York City or into Berlin so that it's a practice in, in trying to, on a regular basis, just regulate myself so that I'm very much in touch with the immersive and sort of transcendentalist kind of inquiry that you can have in the log cabin, but bringing that into cities and bringing that into urban environments. And very much that's what Zach is trying to do now based in San Francisco is bring that um, detox zone that he created at upstate New York into the city experience. Wonderful. So let's open it up for a few more questions. I think we have about 10 minutes left. Yeah. Um, so this is a question primarily for uh, you there with the hat. Um, so early on in the talk, you talked about um, speaking with some folks who were doing the Internet of Things thing and how it seemed like they had come up with some cool technologies and they were casting around for a problem to solve with them. So in my own experience as an artist and a sculptor and a technologist, I find that until I learn a new skill, I often don't come up with the ideas that require the skill. Like until I learned to TIG weld, I had no projects that required TIG welding. As soon as I learned it, I had like 15. And so clearly like coming up with a new thing and then exploring the possibilities is important. At the same time, it's important to find solutions for problems rather than problems for solutions. So do you have any tips about how to go through that process intelligently and how to, you know, make sure that that investigation is properly directed so that you solve real problems? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very interesting question. It's one I've been exploring in the kind of other, other side of my work. So I've actually spent the uh, last six months and uh, six months last winter also uh, working in the, in the development sector. So I've been working in Aswan and looking at how we can work with the local population to solve the problems that they have and the challenge they have with the resources that they have available. And the, the way I look at it is that exploration is, and experimentation are definitely uh, critical factors in that. But it comes more from a kind of, I guess, you, you try things and then you observe, or well, also you observe what's happening in the world around you. So you also let nature also do experimentation. So uh, the, the permaculture principles of observing how plants behave or natural things happen. I picked up a hose pipe in Aswan and it was kicking out piping hot water. So I realized that a solar water heater there could be built with a, um, just a hose pipe connected to a bucket. I mean, admittedly, a very long hose pipe. But so, like, it's, it's, it's a way in which we interact and engage with the world. So it's also constantly questioning. And sometimes that question is through an action and an experiment and through play, but always keeping the problem in mind or multiple problems in mind as you're addressing it. 
And I'm not saying necessarily that it's bad to experiment with technology and play with it. I think it's a very good thing and a very healthy thing because it helps us understand these new possibilities. The, the danger I fear is that we're trying to justify it as the, the, the solution or we're putting all our effort into these solutions and not enough intellectual effort into the problems and exploring these problems with what we already have on the ground and with what is readily accessible and instead we're discarding that and jumping straight to the super high tech when actually often a problem could be solved with a conversation and eye contact and this is I think largely the problem that's inherent is that we're so obsessed with this the shiny and the sexy and that's where all the money is but uh, we just need to look intelligently at what we have and how we use it to solve what we need to solve. It's that wonderful story of the, um, the, uh, Amer the NASA team spending many, many thousands of pounds on a pen that can write in space, um, and after many years of research coming up with this shiny, amazing new pen that could write in space, and then the Russians just used a pencil. Like, this is just that <laughs> example of, you know, think about the problem, don't think about what's the fanciest way you can solve a problem. It's a myth, and but well, so it's interesting because now NASA is actually thinking about what they can do on Earth. So they've, they're designing a bunch of challenges to see how they can apply all their technology to actually solving basic development problems, which um, is, is Jay back to your point. Uh, I think we're basically done. Do we have time for one? I think we have time for one more question. So when I heard about this idea of detoxing by going to the forest or something, I don't, it doesn't sound to me like a, an actual solution. It's kind of like getting methadone, you know, and it seems kind of strange. I mean, I lived in San Francisco, I grew up there, and what I did is I just moved to Seattle. Yeah. That's the solution is that the unhealthy Bay Area culture needs to be destroyed. Yeah. The centralized corporate culture that creates back doors for the NSA, for example, burn them to the ground nonviolently. And, and, and really, I think, you know, returning to nature is it just, it's, we have to change the nature in the direction we want it. So, I mean, I agree to some degree, but we have to do that with free and open systems where we actually regain that control. And that's uh, a thing that's really missing from a lot of the discussion about it is that we're kind of horse trading. And what we need to do is just move to a totally different paradigm of how we control the means of production, actually. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And I couldn't agree more with that. I think, um, so one of, the, one of the books that I'm working on right now is called The Misfit Economy, and in that project we very much look at different ways in which misfits are engaged in this agenda of hacking our cultural institutions. And the hermit to me is an important character within that because these are the people that actually are opting out of the system for very good reasons and pioneering different kinds of alternatives. Well, let me just... <laughs> yeah, but this is, yeah, 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 so this is one of the other kinds of misfits. I think the, they're insider misfits that are implanted in some of our most powerful institutions today that are um, really trying to stealthily transform those institutions from the inside. And some have this narrative of, we want to destroy these institutions, and others take a much more sort of entrepreneurial approach of wanting to change the DNA of those institutions. But I think also to engage with this bigger vision space, sometimes you do need this detox or this experience of peeling out of the system just to deprogram yourself and get in touch with what it is that you feel like you need to do differently. And, you know, Henry Thoreau, who was one of the most famous hermits, after he came back from this amazing transcendental experience, went to work at a pencil factory. So he plugged right back into the system that he was trying to escape. And so I think we need these better pathways for understanding how do you infect systems and how do you transform them. And there's not one theory of change that I would sort of wholeheartedly endorse, but I think there are a variety of sort of misfit orientations or positions that are helpful to that. Wonderful. So we're, we're at time. Thank you guys. What I'd love to do is just take a moment of silence. Um, so if we can all hold hands with the people next to us. <laughs> and just take a moment, close your eyes.
Half finger is okay. Just breathe. You guys <laughs> Yeah? All right. Thank you guys. Thanks to our apostles. Thanks to you.